I'm sure we don't have any problems with that. Uh, what I'm thinking, turn your mics off for the time being. Um, throughout this, I'm going to ask a few questions. Uh, there's not too many of you in here, so when I ask questions, if you want to answer, just turn on your mic and, and say what you got to say. Um, but I do need everybody to go ahead and get into Canvas. If you're not there already, go down to today's date. Uh, and you should be looking at something like this. So a couple of things to just kind of start off with. Um, obviously, I assume everyone's aware uh, CTHS is all virtual for everyone this week. Um, they're going to look at the numbers of uh, kids and teachers on quarantine and, and stuff like that at the end of the week, and then they'll figure out if we're coming back or not next week. Um, the good thing is that doesn't really affect our game plan for the week at all. Uh, tomorrow we do still have our DBQSA. Um, you still are going to have that prep sheet due tomorrow as well. Uh, the good thing is today we're going to kind of talk through a portion of the prep sheet, make sure everybody understands exactly what all they need to do. Um, we're, we're just going to kind of talk our way through it, very similar to what we did last week when we did the practice DBQ. Uh, and then if you have any questions, you know, at the end, we can certainly uh, address those. And once we're done, if we finish early, if y'all just want to stay on here and talk with each other and get some of your social interaction uh, out of the way, that's fine as well. Um, but in the interest of saving time, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, you are going to need to open up the Peter the Great DBQ uh, under yesterday and also the DBQ prep sheet. We're going to be kind of flipping back and forth between those. Give me a minute or so to get that squared away. Uh, one other thing, for the remainder of the week, because tomorrow we're, we're doing the essay, that's, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, and then Thursday and Friday, you've got an assignment based on a reading from the AMSCO book. Probably not going to do a live Teams meeting the rest of the week just because of the sort of stuff that we're doing. Uh, that being said, I am going to be available during each class period. So if you've got questions or concerns, uh, just shoot me an email. I'll, I'll get right on it. Uh, and if it's something that I can't handle in an email, we need to talk about a little bit more in depth, then of course we can hop over in Teams uh, if necessary. Uh, but I repeat, no live Teams meeting, at least for not like for the whole class, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. That being said, I'm going to post a short, probably a little flip grip video each day with just some some kind of, I don't know, introductory type information. Make sure you watch those, especially for the DBQ tomorrow. I'm going to have all sorts of tips and, and just real basic things I need to go over because uh, I'm sure that there's going to be an abundance of things that I forget. Uh, so first and foremost, let's go ahead and take a look at the actual DBQ, the Peter the Great. DBQ. Uh, this says 60 minutes, and in real life, like on the AP test, that's how much time you'd have. Uh, for the one tomorrow, it is going to be 45 minutes. Uh, the reason is, A, we don't have hour-long class periods, so I can't really give you 60 minutes, and B, uh, at this point, you've had like two days, or you're going to have two days to look over the documents and kind of plan it out. So honestly, if you get your prep sheet done and if you kind of follow along today, there's no reason that, that 45 minutes shouldn't be enough time. Just make sure that when you choose to start writing the essay that you can finish in that 45 minutes uh, because it's kind of one of those things you do need to do in one sitting. Uh, so first step, when you're writing a DBQ, much like any essays, you got to figure out what in the world you're supposed to be writing about. Uh, so take some time on the writing prompt. Read it, reread it, maybe read it again. Take those deep breaths we talked about. The good thing is this one's really easy. This is super straightforward. Uh, so here is your prompt. <clears throat> Using the documents and your knowledge of world history, describe the steps Peter the Great took during his reign, 1682 to 1725, to modernize Russia and transform it into a major European power. So last week you read the chapter on the Russian Empire. You, you did some vocabulary. 
uh, in your notebook. You were supposed to do that flow map with some of the Russian czars and kind of describe uh, some of their characteristics, some of their personal characteristics, some of the characteristics of their rules. Um, Peter the Great was one of those guys. And as you recall, he's he's the one that was really known for trying to transform Russia. He thought that that how they were living was antiquated, especially compared uh, to the countries of Western Europe, which during this time period, they're already engaged in overseas colonization. They're making a lot of money. Uh, things are advancing very quickly in Western Europe, whereas in Russia, they're pretty much doing things how they did, you know, several hundred years before. He's the guy that wanted to change that. And in each of the seven documents, you're going to see Peter the Great, either from his own point of view or others' points of view, doing something to modernize Russia, to try to transform Russia into this awesome major European power that that other countries can look up to and kind of respect. So on your prep sheet, which you should also have up and running, basically as you read each document, you were supposed to give a real brief summary of that document, okay? But the summary you're given, it should be, hey, what's Peter the Great doing in this document to try to train Russia, to try to change Russia? Uh, to try to make them a little bit more like the countries of Western Europe. Now, we're going to read through the first probably four together. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys some questions. That's where you hopefully will, will feel comfortable enough getting on the microphone and saying what you think. Uh, and then really, I think after we do like four of these, you're going to kind of start to see the direction the rest of the essay and the rest of the prep sheet can go. So let's look at document number one. And I want you thinking, hey, what's Peter the Great doing here to modernize his nation? Now, when you read these documents, you always want to look at the sources. Um, this can tell you sometimes a lot. It can tell you a lot about what you're going to see in the document. Also, just keeping in mind where it's coming from, who it's coming from, may help you think about things that may or may not have shaped this document. So source for document one, it's Bishop Burnett of England describing Peter the Great in 1698. And, and it, it seems to imply in the document that Peter the Great traveled to England at some time and, and met up with this guy. So what's Peter the Great doing here to modernize his nation? He was desirous to understand our doctrine, but he did not seem disposed to mend matters in Muscovy, which is Moscow. He was indeed resolved to encourage learning and to polish people by sending some of them to travel in other countries and to draw strangers to come and live among them. He seemed apprehensive still of his sister's intrigues. There was a mixture both of passion and severity in his temper. He is resolute, but understands little of war and seemed not at all inquisitive that way. So based on what we just read in document one, who can tell me, and if you want, you can use the little hand raise feature. That may be better than everybody just yelling over each other. Um, but who can tell me what Peter the Great was doing in this guy's opinion to modernize his nation, to improve things, to transform the Russian empire? See, everybody was all talkative earlier, but now nobody wants to say anything. Let me help you. I'm going to highlight something. Look right here in the middle. You can unmute yourself, Skyler. Good encouragement, but you could also just answer the question, too. All right, Skyler, yes. Yeah, I. I figured out how to raise my hand, but it I it didn't like show up that I raised my hand. That's well, didn't weird. he like he moved them away from like civil war and war with other places? Okay, he he's talking about moving people, but it's not so much it's not so much to avoid war. Okay, think about why he would want to not only move Russians out of the country, but also move foreigners in. He wants to mix them in. He wants to integrate their culture with the Russian culture. Good job. Good okay. job, Abby. Yeah. 
No, that, that was great. And you weren't wrong. There's a lot of different ways to interpret these documents, but look at what it says. He was indeed resolved to encourage learning. So he's encouraging education. He wants people to learn about the world outside of Russia. And he wants to polish, you can assume, his people by sending them to travel to other countries and to bring strangers to come in and live among them. Because again, he thinks that Russia's behind. He wants them to be a little bit more like other countries in Europe. So for me, the things that he's doing here to improve his country, and you may have something slightly different, it's, it's okay. But what I got, he's encouraging, and you're gonna see some terrible spelling here, guys. Encouraging education, but also exposure to foreigners. To foreigners, ideas. Oh my God, that is the worst spelling I've ever seen. Froeners. Tell Mr. Brown does not teach English class. I probably a little over reliant on my spell check. So here he's in court. God, I can't even talk now. Can't spell or talk. He's encouraging education. He's encouraging exposure to foreigners and foreign ideas. To me, I think, yeah, you know, those are it's a pretty good summary of the sort of things that he's doing to, to kind of modernize Russia to, to try to bring them up to speed. You're going to see some similar stuff going on in future documents. Good job. Let's look at document number two. Document number two, the source is Peter the Great himself. And it's a royal decree. And that's that's like a mandate. He's telling you this is how it's going to be. He's the czar. He can do whatever he wants. A royal decree requiring education of Russian nobles. Education. Hmm, sounds like we talked about that before. Uh, and then he says, send to every region some persons from mathematical schools to teach the children of the nobility, except those of freeholders and government clerks. Uh, mathematics and geometry, those are the they're going to teach, which you know, geometry is a math subject, but whatever. As a penalty, no one will be allowed to marry unless he learns these subjects. Seems kind of harsh, but whatever. Okay, he's a czar, he can do whatever he wants. What's he encouraging here, guys? Math. Math. Education. He wants them to learn some stuff. He says, my people are not educated. That's one of the reasons we're not modernized. We need to fix that. So what do you know? Once again, he's encouraging education, encouraging knowledge. You know, pretty darn similar. Not the exact same, but pretty similar to what we saw in document one. Let's keep looking. You're probably going to see some more similarities. Uh, we got another decree from Peter the Great, a decree on foreigners. Now, just based on what you've read thus far, what do you think this is going to have to do with? What, what, what do you think he's going to say about foreigners? He's going to encourage them. Encourage them to do what? To trade. To integrate into like Russia's culture. Yeah. Is he going to talk over me? <laughs> I was on my other screen trying to get over. That's fine. It's fine. I see how it is. No, no. You, you both just have so much to share that, that sometimes it's just got to get it out. And it's okay. It's no big deal. Let's look at this. And, and you're, you're probably right. You are right. Okay. We know based on what we've even seen thus far, he thinks the Russian people are behind, they're backwards. They need to really look to foreigners to give them good ideas of how to be innovative, of how to become educated, of how to live their lives. All right. So you already kind of have an idea going in, but let's look for some more specific stuff. Since our accession to the throne, all our efforts and intentions have tended to govern this realm in such a way that all of our subjects should, through our care for the general good, become more and more prosperous. For this end, we have always tried to maintain internal order, to defend the state against invasion, and in every possible way to improve and extend trade. I think that's a pretty big one right there, because it definitely falls in line with some of the stuff that we've already seen. 
With this purpose, we have been compelled to make some necessary and salutary changes in the administration in order that our subjects might more easily gain a knowledge of matters of which they were before ignorant. So again, it wants his people gain in some knowledge, wants them to learn about stuff uh, outside of what they would normally see in the Russian Empire. So easily gain a knowledge of matters of which they were before ignorant and become more skillful in their commercial relations, which again goes back to trade. We have therefore given orders, made dispositions, and founded institutions indispensable for increasing our, what do you know, trade with foreigners. Okay, you got to make those contacts uh, and shall do the same in the future. To attain these worthy aims, we have endeavored to improve our military forces, which are the protection of our state, uh, so that our troops may consist of well-drilled men maintained in perfect order and discipline. We have probably highlight that as well, because there's some directions you can go with that if you so choose. Uh, anyway, in order to obtain greater improvement in this respect, so how are you going to improve the military? Comes with encouraging foreigners, uh, foreigners to come in and assist, teach them how to, how to run their military, how to do things in their style. I also encourage artisans who are profitable in the state to come in numbers to our country. So to me, and, and let me see if you got anything different here, but again, he seems to be encouraging contact with foreigners, trade with foreigners, foreigners coming into Russia, uh, foreigners that can help the economy, help with trade, help with their military. Uh, did anybody see anything completely different? I will take that as you agree. So let's look at our little prep sheet here. To me, yeah, I mean, it's pretty similar. Let's just say increase exposure to foreigners, to foreign ideas and interventions and all sorts of cool stuff. I meant innovations, but whatever. Uh, exposure to foreigners because they're the ones that are doing the cool stuff. Let's go through one more that I'm actually going to read with you guys, and, and then I think you're going to see some trends. Now, this one's kind of weird, but you can actually tell exactly what he wants right here. Decree on Western style clothes. I'm going to read through this just because it's hilarious, but uh, just listen to what he's saying. He, he thinks that, that the Russian people are just so backwards and so unappealing in their appearance. You know, so so similar to how they've been dressing and, and kind of fashioning themselves for the previous, you know, couple hundred years. He's actually mandating what people are going to wear from now on. Again, he wants them to wear Western style clothes, which when you hear West in this context, you're talking about Western Europe. OK, the West. Western dress shall be worn by all the boyers. Remember, that's the nobility. Uh, members of our councils and of our court, the gentry of Moscow, secretaries, provincial gentry, uh, the gostier, the merchants, government officials, streltsy, members of the guilds purveying for our household citizens of Moscow of all ranks and residents of provincial cities, excepting the clergy and the peasant tillers of the soil. So he's saying, you know, members of the church, uh, like priests and whatnot, uh, the farmers, they don't have to adhere to this. This is mainly for the upper classes. Uh, the upper dress shall be a French or Saxon cut, and the lower dress, waistcoat, trousers, boots, shoes, and hats, shall be of the German type. They shall also ride German saddles. Likewise, the women folk of all ranks, including priests, deacons, and church attendants' wives, the wives of dragoons, which I don't know what that is, uh, the soldiers and the streltsy, and their children shall wear Western dresses, hats, jackets, and underwear, underwear, undervests, and petticoats, and shoes. From now on, no one of the above is to wear Russian dress or Circassian coats, sheepskin coats, trousers, boots, and shoes. It is also forbidden to ride Russian saddles, and the craftsmen shall not manufacture them or sell them at the marketplace. So I kind of highlight this, this top portion for a reason, because it kind of sums it all up. What's, uh, what's Peter the Great doing here to make them a little bit more modern? 
Forcing them to dress like the Westerners. Come on, Abby. What? Let's go. You're faster than I am. Uh, Don't be slow then. Come on now, Skylar. Come on now. So, yeah, kind of ridiculous. But to me, you know, he he's literally trying to change the culture. He's reforming the culture. He's mandating Western style dress. Uh, so I'd even put here mandate, I don't know, clothing or, or style of dress. You could even say something like cultural reform. I mean, he's he's literally changing what people wear and how they appear. A little bit later, you'll see one. He's making people cut their beards off. Now, to get full credit on DBQ, you got to use at least six of the seven essays. But just look at what we have here. We're seeing we're seeing several different things that cultural of reform. Oh my God. Cultural reform. We're seeing several different things that Peter the Great's doing. Guys, you've got enough here for your thesis statement. So the the just go back to it. The prompt is, you know, what sort of steps you're describing the steps that he took during his rule to transform Russia, to modernize Russia. Guys, based on what you're seeing in the documents, you could say Peter the Great took many steps to modernize his nation, such as encouraging education, increasing exposure to foreign ideas, and even reforming traditional Russian culture. Guys, you get your thesis from the documents. You take what the documents give you. That's the beauty of the DBQ. You don't have to know anything. It helps if you do. Don't get me wrong. But it's the only type of writing that we do that you don't need an abundance of content knowledge you just need to be able to read the documents and, and kind of look for some general themes now i'm not going to type out everything else but let's just look at these real briefly uh document five it's a statute it's a law for the college of manufacturers so probably has something to do with education probably has something to do with manufacturing uh but if you look um da, 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 talking about you know how he's encouraging people to build factories um to spread them throughout the empire but but how are they going to do this how are they going to find all the expertise uh, to teach them how to how to make all these cool products what do you know foreigners here you have a biography of peter the great and the first line tells you what's up the czar labored at reform of fashions or uh, more properly speaking, of dress. He was going to mandate how people looked. And in this case, he didn't like the fact that, that a lot of Russian men traditionally had these really long beards. He thought that they looked unfashionable. Uh, so he started saying, hey, you got you to gotta cut these beards, otherwise we're going to tax you 100 ruples a year. Which I don't know exactly how much that is, but I'm, I'm fairly certain it was a decent amount, you know, because he wanted people to cut their beards. He wanted them to look a little bit more modern, kind of like he looked himself. Last document, it's not really a document, it's a painting. Uh, and we can assume that he had this commissioned. You got Peter here looking pretty, pretty suave, you know. Uh, we can assume that this is a European style of the time. So in, in some ways, maybe he's He's further encouraging people to, to dress in those fashions. He's, he's kind of a role model. Uh, you see that he doesn't have the long beard. So, you know, this is kind of what he's wanting the, uh, the boyers, the nobility to look like. But there's other things you could read into it. You know, he's trying to transform the nation by projecting power. I mean, the dude is holding a sword. He is leaning on a cannon like, hey, you know, we're sophisticated. We got a good military. We're, we're keeping up with you guys in Europe, uh, but we're also smart. We're knowledgeable. We've got maps and stuff. Um, again, a lot of different directions you could go, but this also falls in line with some of the other things we've seen, encouraging a certain style of dress, encouraging education, uh, relying on foreign ideas. Again, just based on that, you've got enough now to write your essay. And you could have actually read a decent essay off of just like four documents. You wouldn't have gotten full credit, but you'd have enough. So I think you get the gist of this first part. You're just uh, creating some real brief summaries. But again, your, your summaries should reflect your prompt. You're looking for what the prompt's asking for. 
You're looking in this case for ways that he modernizes the nation. And that's what you'll do in, in all your DBQs. Now, another point category is the weird one that we talked about, but this is the fun one. This is the one you get to get very creative with. Uh, it's called sourcing your documents. And, and this goes back to CAP, you know, context, audience, purpose, point of view. These are issues. These are external factors that are going to shape what's in the document, whatever document it is. What's the context? What civilization is it coming out of? What's going on at that time? Who is the intended audience? Uh, again, if you're writing something for one person to read or, you know, 100,000 people to read, that is going to change how you put things. The point of view, Peter the Great and the biographer and the bishop, based on who they are as individuals, based on their upbringing, based on their social status, based on their authority, they're going to describe things in their own weird ways. And then purpose, what's the agenda? So I'm going to show you one of these, and this is just, this is complete speculation. Probably not even true. That's what's fun about this portion. It just shows that it, it's got to be logical, okay? It can't be completely out there. But it shows that you're thinking more deeply about what the document says, and more importantly, why it says that. So let's look at document one real quick, and then I'll kind of uh, speed through the rest of this, because we're almost done. Document one, most of these are from Peter, but document one isn't. This is from uh, uh, an English bishop. And he's talking about Peter. We assume they met. He's talking about all the cool things that Peter needs to learn. Uh, and he's kind of implying that Russia is a little bit backwards, you know, uh, that, that you know, again, he, he needs to, he's wanting to send his people to different countries or have foreigners come in to teach him stuff. But also look here at the end. There was a mixture of both passion and severity in his temper. He is resolute, but understands little of war and seemed not at all inquisitive that way. Well, I would think Peter the Great would want to go and learn more about, like, you know, warfare, modern warfare, modern militaries. But this guy's like, nah, he didn't care about that. And me, I take that as he's almost, you know, seeing Peter as very naive. Uh, maybe he's even critical of him. Maybe he sees all this as a, a sign of Russia's cultural inferiority. Do I know any of that for a fact? No, but I'm speculating. So here's what I might put. The, and these are sentence stems. This is what I mean by two complete sentences. You're basically finishing the sentence stems for three of the seven documents. So the point of view of document one, not Q, is an English bishop. Now that's not enough to get you a point. All you've done here is identify. You then need to take it further. You then need to explain how the fact that this dude's an English bishop might kind of influence what he says. Uh, so you could say something like, because he is English, and forgive all my bad spelling, uh, he may have described Peter as being ignorant or naive to make Russia sound culturally inferior to England. It's all a bunch of crap that I just made up, but it sounds good and it may very well be true. I don't know that. You have no way of knowing that. Just like a historian that writes a book on Peter the Great and looks at this document has no way of knowing that. But that could be a conclusion that you drew and it kind of makes sense. And it shows that you're thinking more deeply and complexly about the document, and why it says what it says. That's how you get that point. And I actually should have put the uh, this one down here. This is significant because so, I'd share that with you because he is English. So there you go. There's one you could actually use. Now you got to come up with the other two, but I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you even one more. I'm not gonna type it in, uh, but let's just look at it real quick. Where am I? Where am I? The painting's pretty fun. Okay. It's got an agenda here. You know, he's he probably had this painting himself. He's a czar. He wants to look cool. 
Okay, that's probably the purpose. Uh, but for me, I would say maybe audience. You know, who do you think this is intended for? Uh, maybe people down the line, you know, they're going to view this uh, later in history classes and learn about Peter the Great. You go that route. Uh, me, I'm thinking his audience, maybe this is like the Russian nobility, the boyers. So I would put something to the extent of the intended audience of uh, this painting, you know, the people that were going to see it, uh, document seven is probably, because then you leave some wiggle room, probably the Russian nobility. Uh, Peter probably had himself painted this way to encourage the nobility to wear similar styles of dress uh, in the fashion uh, of those in Western Europe. Um, you could get further into it. He's trying to project strength and the value of education and all that stuff. Uh, but again, we don't really know that. I don't know that. You don't know that. But it makes sense. And that's all the cap process is, guys. If you at least try this for three documents, even if you're kind of out there a little bit, I will give you the point. Okay. And that's you know one point on this essay. It's a seven, guys. So do this. Try it. It's okay if you don't 100% get it yet. It, it's weird. I acknowledge that. But it's just you drawing conclusions. That's really all it is. All right. Your next part, part three, based on the documents, the essay prompt in your knowledge, world history, brainstorm ideas for a quality introductory paragraph that establishes context and thesis. You can either type out your entire introduction, which would be a great idea because then you could just copy and paste that directly into your essay, you know, save yourself some writing time. Uh, but honestly, put context and give me some bullet points. Put thesis and give me some bullet points. So, so think about context. That's your background information. You got to imagine I don't know anything. I, you've got to tell me everything about Russia. I, I don't even know what Russia is. Never heard of it. Never heard of the Russian Empire. Don't know anything. So where in the world are we talking about? When? What time period are we talking about Russia is an empire really kind of beginning? What was Russia before it was an empire? You know, there were those independent city states that got conquered by the Mongols and ruled over by the tributary system, and then they rebelled, and then they become the Russian Empire. You can maybe talk about some of that stuff. Who were some of the czars before Peter the Great to kind of get them on their way to being an empire? Uh, how does Peter the Great even come to power? How does his family get the throne? Uh, we talked about a certain group that takes over at a certain point. You know, you can talk about that. Uh, why is Russia further behind in a lot of ways than some of those more prestigious countries of Western Europe? Again, three, four good solid sentences, lots of details, names, places, you know, vocab terms. That's how you get your context. If you leave it vague, you're not going to get it. Then you close out with your thesis. And guys, if you summarize the documents earlier, you got it. Uh, Peter encouraged education. He exposed people to foreign ideas. He mandated European styles of dress. He reformed overall culture. He did this. He did that. Uh, you can literally list out every single separate thing that he did, but try to streamline it. You're going to see a few different documents where he was encouraging, you know, trade or connections with foreigners. You're going to see a few different documents where he's changing the culture of Russia. You're going to see a couple different documents where he's encouraging education. So try to streamline it, maybe just three or four things. Then use that to format the rest of your essay. Now, this last part looks like it's massive. It's not. There doesn't need to be a whole lot in here. I put six paragraphs to give you more than enough room. But what I'm looking for here is that you've given some forethought to the structure of your essay. So maybe you decide to say one of the things that he did to, to modernize his nation was encourage education. And maybe that's document one and two. Well, in body paragraph one, maybe that's where you talk about documents one and two. You're talking about them together because they're, they're trying to accomplish similar things. So maybe here you put document one and two. We're going to focus on education. Then maybe in the second paragraph, we're going to focus on all the weird styles he's making people adhere to. Uh, and maybe that's like document, I don't know, I remember, five and seven. I just want to see you kind of lay out where you're going to talk about which documents. Then maybe even get more in depth. Where are you going to uh, get that cap stuff in your document source? Uh, where might you want to integrate that? Is it going to be with those documents? Is it going to be in its own paragraph? I mean, you could do it either way. Uh, where are you going to try to try to uh, you know put in some outside evidence? What's some stuff that's not in the documents that you know from your reading or the video or whatever that will help make your essay a little bit more complete? 
Again, outside evidence, specific terms, people, places, you know, ideas, something specific. Think like vocabulary that you can then explain and it actually makes sense to be in your essay. If it's not anywhere in the documents, guys, that can be your outside evidence. You only have to do it once, but especially if you want that last complexity point, do it more if you can. Um, that's pretty much it for the prep sheet. Uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, two more things I want to show you, then, then I'm going to let you, I'm going to turn off the recording. If you guys want to talk for the rest of the period, that's fine. If you want to log off, that's fine. Um, if you look under today's day, Tuesday. There's two things out of that. First, you've got the AP scoring rubric. We went over the College Board rubric last week, and that's the one that's more in depth, gets into way more specific detail. Read it when you get a chance. This is what I actually look at when I score your essays. Uh, again, give it a gander when you get a chance, um, but really, you know, be familiar with how many points you need. Uh, it's very similar to the one that we have for our LEQs. If you write this essay, and I see a little bit of effort, 60. That's kind of your floor. Now, keep in mind, it needs to be at least on topic. Um, it needs to be more than a couple sentences. You know, this is a full-blown essay. There should be multiple paragraphs there. Um, really, for a DBQ, even an LEQ, I'd say page and a half, probably minimum. Um, even though there's not technically a minimum or a maximum, if it's less than a page and a half, uh, or especially if it's like less than a full page, you probably didn't put enough into it. Because again, we're looking for detail. Um, again, from there, it goes in five point increments. If you can get at least one point, which is not hard to get. I mean, if you just discuss three of the documents and it's on topic, you can get one point, okay? Um, but, you know, it goes in five point increments. So you get a one, you get a 70, you get all seven points. Obviously, you get 100. 100 is going to be pretty hard to get because, again, that last point, the unicorn point, this one, the complex understanding, man, it's got to be a rock solid essay. You've got to know more than you're required to to really get that. Um, but in here, if it's solid and you use all your documents and you got a bunch of evidence, I will be a little bit more flexible in giving that out. Um, so a seven is hard to get, but, but really, you know, if you just follow the steps, this is not as bad as it seems. The last thing, and this is optional. If you want to watch it, you can, I think it'd be helpful, especially if you still got some questions. Uh, but I got a little video from our old bearded friend, uh, Mr. Heimler, which for some reason it doesn't want to go there on its own, uh, where he's just breaking down DBQ. He's got a few different DBQ videos, but this is the one that's the most up to date. Um, right here. Um, it's like 15 minutes, so I get it if you don't want to watch it, but he's going to explain things in a different way than I do. Uh, he gets into more like complex thesis statements and things like that, which at this point I don't think are absolutely necessary, but uh, again, if you want to watch it, I highly encourage you to do so. Um, just a couple of reminders. Your prep sheet is due in its entirety tomorrow before 11.59. Your DBQ essay is due tomorrow before 11.59. If you have questions, email me before you start the essay. If you're in the middle of the essay, I may not get to you in time. Plus, I'm not going to answer a whole lot when you're already right. So if you have questions that come up after this or tonight or tomorrow or whatever, before you do it, email me. And like I said, if we can handle it through the email, I'll do it that way. If not, We'll pop into Teams. We can talk like we are today. That's fine. Uh, I'm not planning on having an official like class, uh, large class Teams meeting for the rest of the week, just because tomorrow's essay and Thursday and Friday, you're basically just reading and answering some questions. So there's not much of a need for it. Um, but if you need something, um, email me. We can get into Teams if we need to. Um, again, out of tomorrow, you're going to have daily grade and a test grade. Please get them done. Please get them done on time. Uh, you can turn in the prep sheet whenever you want, but I would keep it until you're done with your DBQ. Um, also, the DBQ is going to open up in the morning. It is not open yet, but it'll open up uh, by probably 8.30 tomorrow morning. So whenever you want to jump into it, uh, go ahead. Um, that's pretty much all I got for you. Uh, do you guys have any questions? And for this, because we don't want people hopping over each other, use a little hand raise feature. And uh, again, I'll answer whatever. You got on your mind. 
give you as long as it takes me to take a couple of sips of coffee to, to come up with something. Okay, so if you come up with questions, email me. Uh, if you want to stay on here for the last eight minutes of class and you guys just talk to each other, I know you're all stuck at home. That is fine. Uh, if you don't want to do that, uh, you can go ahead and log off. You, you got credit for being here. Um, so, yeah, if you need anything, let me know. I'll be on for a little bit longer. But uh, other than that, if you want to log out, you're certainly free to do so. Thank you so much for attending today.